Good afternoon and welcome to our very special webinar presentation, Cryptocurrency Boom in Latin America. Uh, my name is Lindsay Lear. I lead the payments practice at America's Market Intelligence. And for those of you who are not familiar with AMI, we are dedicated to analyzing, providing insights into the payments industry in Latin America to help our clients and our audience make the best strategic decisions in this environment that is increasingly complex, increasingly competitive. And uh, for that reason, we're very excited to bring this content to you today um, uh, in partnership with Bitso, which many of you uh, may know is a leading cryptocurrency exchange in Latin America. We're thrilled to have our special guest today. We'll be introducing in a moment. Uh, and before we get into our content, just a couple of words about why we are presenting this content today. Um, we are, uh, oops, if you go back, Tim, just one. Thank you. Uh, we are, um, AMI is dedicated to bringing the most relevant and recent insights into the industry to our audience. And as you all know, uh, over the past year, cryptocurrencies have really exploded in Latin America. In the press, in the news, we see crypto events happening increasingly. Uh, Almost on a weekly basis, we have news from new exchanges. We have uh, legacy players announcing integrations and partnerships related to digital currencies. We have governments making uh, announcements very relevant and interesting in the region. So, uh, of course, this is a, a totally new topic for us uh, and for, for most of our network. We know that this topic can be intimidating. It can be difficult to understand. Uh, and so we are here today to try to provide a little bit of, of landscaping to provide the basics of what we think is happening, what we see emerging in Latin America, and why, what is important for you to pay attention to. Uh, at the end of the day, we have come to realize that every company operating in the payment space in Latin America now needs a cryptocurrency strategy. So this webinar is a bit of a first attempt to help guide our audience in developing that strategy and understanding what are the key uh, nuggets of information that you need to know to do that. So Thank you again for being here. A couple of housekeeping items. A uh, question we get every webinar, we will be sharing both the presentation deck and the recording at the end of this session. So uh, please look out for that, you know, a day or two after the session that will be available. And we would love for you to ask your questions at the bottom of the Zoom panel, you'll see a Q&A button. So please go ahead and, uh, and, and ask your questions. We'll address them at the end when we have our panel discussion with our, with our guests. Very quick legal notice. Uh, standard procedure, please be sure to take all the information you see today, uh, you know, in conjunction with other information and, and be responsible for any decisions you make based on that information. Uh, let's get into our introductions and who are, are, are who will be uh, delivering our, our, our discussion today. I'm very happy and proud to introduce Tim Jaglitch on, on our team, senior analyst at AMI and our very own in-house cryptocurrency specialist. Tim, welcome. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here talking about uh, this very important topic. As Lindsay mentioned, I have uh, been leading the research efforts of AMI into cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, focusing particularly on the bridges that are being built uh, between the financial tools that, that consumers in this, in this region are already comfortable with and the new technologies that are being deployed in the crypto space. So really excited to have the opportunity to speak a little bit more about that uh, in, this, in this event. Excellent. Thank you, Tim. And we're honored to be joined by Abraham Cobos, Crypto Strategy Manager from Bitso. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know, Bitso is Latin America's leading cryptocurrency exchange and the region's first cryptocurrency related unicorn. So uh, Abraham, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Please take a moment. Tell us about yourself and a little bit about Bitso. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. It's always super important to tell the story about crypto and how this technology is enabling financial freedom across the world. Uh, and a little bit about Bitso. We just reached the, I think that some days ago, 3 million users. We are the leading crypto exchange and crypto platform in, in Latin America. And my specific role is leading the implementation of innovation products and defining which assets we should be including in the platform. And also I'm helping define the strategy of Bitso for all the company. So pretty, uh, it's a great job to be at the forefront of the industry, investigating how to implement crypto to, 
to the world in Latin America. Terrific. Well, we're, we really look forward to your remarks. Um, to give you all a little bit of what the agenda is today, uh, we'll start off with some present a few presentation slides from Tim, presenting some original from new AMI research, followed by a, you know uh, hopefully 20 to 30 minutes of discussion with Abraham and as well as your your questions. So we're we're going to have an exciting uh, exciting session. Now to to before I turn it over to Tim, I wanted to uh, let you all know that. You know, uh, one of many of you probably have already tried to do your own desk research around cryptocurrency in Latin America and probably been very disappointed. There's very little information out there, uh, uh, especially on, on Latin America. And uh, the number one question that we get from our clients is what's the adoption rate of crypto so far? What are the use cases that people are interested in? And so to take the temperature very, you know, very basic, you know, we wanted to just take the temperature of consumers in the region. We, about uh, two weeks ago, finalized um, a, a survey of 400 consumers in the region across four markets to gauge level of adoption, level of interest, and the uses of cryptocurrency so far. Tim is going to take us uh, uh, in depth into, into those results. But to start, I want to already, you know, pull our audience here to figure out how much has our audience, uh, which is going to be uh, especially digitized, interested in payments, how much have you all invested in crypto? So we're going to launch a poll. You'll see on your screen here uh, the question. We want to know um, what is your level of experience with cryptocurrency so far? Are you an active trader? Have you purchased at least once uh, just to maybe test it out? Are you interested but haven't yet uh, taken the plunge or so far you're, you're not interested? Go ahead and take a moment uh, to, to answer that. And in the meantime, I will tell you about the poll that we, we conducted with consumers. Uh, you'll see in the results, we conducted in an online survey with 400 consumers, Brazil, Mexico, Peru, and Argentina around uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, just about, we finalized the results just about a week ago. And so it's highly, highly updated. Uh, very interesting. Tim's gonna show us the details there, but just wanted to share with you a little bit of the methodology. All right, looks like we have just almost everyone. We'll take about 10 more seconds to get your vote in. Okay, let's go ahead and share those results. Okay, so we have 17% of our, of our attendees today have already, are, 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 are frequent uh, crypto purchasers. So that, that's pretty aggressive, that, that's pretty good. 23% have already, so we have a full 40% of our participants have already purchased cryptocurrency. So that's, that's pretty remarkable. And almost half are interested, but have not yet done it. Crypto curious is what, what we call that. So, okay, very, very interesting. We'll, we'll see how this compares with the overall, overall Latin America sample in a moment. So thank you all for your, for your response. And I'll turn it over now to Tim to, to walk us through some of our AMI's research um, and get us started. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, so we at AMI uh, are, are focused on Latin America and the Caribbean, as Lindsay mentioned. And one of the points we'd like to make uh, for all of you today is that in the world of crypto, you should be too. Latin America uh, is truly emerging as the frontier of digital currency innovation and uptake. Uh, just in the last uh, year, year and a half, uh, Latin America has been home to the world's first fully operational central bank digital currency in the Bahamas with the Bahaman sand dollar. And uh, just very recently, uh, which we'll chat about Abram, uh, we'll chat about with uh, Abram in, in just a few minutes, uh, the world's first Bitcoinized economy in El Salvador. Um, so these uh, truly are, you know, uh, groundbreaking uh, initiatives uh, that, that are really testing the boundaries of digital currency technology and cryptocurrency um, and really, uh, we think, will reveal powerful lessons um, for the global financial system and, and what, uh, what other regions and countries um, will be able to do with these technologies. So we wanted to share some initial thoughts on why Latin America uh, has emerged as, as truly a uh, the perfect laboratory for 
cryptocurrency innovation. Uh, there are a couple of, of factors that, that come immediately to mind. Um, uh, so certainly the, uh, the bank penetration and digitization rates and, and the gap that exists uh, between uh, bank account ownership and smartphone ownership and internet access uh, is a powerful catalyst uh, for new technologies. So uh, when millions of Latin Americans have access to the internet, but not to a bank account that creates room for other financial products, such as crypto wallets that can be accessed uh, online. And an interesting possibility that that then creates is uh, for some consumers to leapfrog the traditional uh, financial system uh, straight to a crypto product as their first financial tool. Um, another uh, factor that contributes to Latin America's uh, crypto innovation is the, the robust inbound remittance flows uh, into the region. Uh, in 2020, uh, that those flows totaled to more than $100 billion. Uh, and this uh, robust volume, uh, unfortunately, has not been matched uh, always by innovation in the cross-border transfer space. So still many Latin Americans uh, experience friction in receiving payouts from abroad, from family members living in other countries, and also have to pay high remittance fees, which creates the room that creates room for products that can accomplish that same goal of getting funds uh, from, from overseas at a lower cost and maybe a faster speed, such as crypto, uh, that, that creates the opportunity for, for alternative technologies to disrupt that, that space. And then finally, um, as, as you all uh, will be aware, Latin America is, is home to some of the world's most volatile national currencies. Uh, so certainly in the case of Venezuela, uh, we've seen you know, a, a near collapse of, of the currency uh, since uh, the beginning of, of 2020. You can see a substantial decline in the value against the dollar. But in Argentina as well, rampant inflation has driven down the price of the domestic currency uh, creating an incentive for uh, nationals of these countries um, to hold their, their savings in another asset, an alternative asset to prevent erosion, which creates uh, another opportunity for crypto products, alternative uh, digital currency products um, to fill that need uh, for consumers in these spaces, uh, whereas other consumers elsewhere with more stable currencies may be more hesitant uh, because of the volatility of some cryptocurrencies. So this is all to say that Latin America uh, has is the perfect storm for digital currency innovation. And uh, we are certainly seeing that reflected in consumer preferences uh, as relates to crypto. So as Lindsay mentioned, this is just a first look uh, at uh, the preferences of consumers throughout the region, um, but it is a very powerful snapshot uh, taken, as Lindsay mentioned, just a couple of weeks ago to give a sense of the consumer enthusiasm for crypto products. So across uh, these markets that we surveyed, 8% of consumers reported already purchasing cryptocurrency. Um, that number is, is remarkable. Uh, it, is, uh, it is even higher in markets like Argentina, which have kind of that uh, inflation factor that we mentioned. Um, but another fa uh, factor that we wanted to mention, or another figure here, is that an additional 18% are interested in purchasing crypto, but haven't made the leap yet, which is to say that nearly a fourth or over a fourth of Latin American consumers either have purchased or want to purchase crypto. Um, to put that in perspective, uh, we have here on the right credit card penetration rates across all of these markets. So as it stands, the crypto penetration is below that, that credit card number in all markets. But imagine uh, for a moment uh, if all of the consumers who are interested uh, joined the crypto ecosystem. Um, that could rival the penetration of, of credit cards, which again is would have been unthinkable um, until very recently. So crypto is gaining traction throughout the region and, and is doing so very quickly. One thing that, that it is important to note is that as we think about that 
first generation of crypto users, that, that 8% of, of early adopters um, versus the, the crypto curious, those who are interested in crypto but haven't yet made a purchase, um, is they have very different preferences. Um, they're, they're different groups of people who will be interested in different sets of di digital currency products. Um, so the crypto user base, those who are early adopters, um, for our data are mostly male, uh, mostly working age, and tend to come from a higher income level, which, which tracks, um, especially since many crypto exchanges uh, have on-ramps, or until very recently have had on-ramps, limited to bank transfers, um, so potentially excluding many consumers who, who lack a bank account. And these crypto users uh, certainly are very interested in the investment uh, portion of crypto, wanting to see a, a nice return when, when a crypto asset goes to the moon, so to speak. Um, but they also uh, exhibited a, a strong um, confidence or strong enthusiasm for the decentralized spirit of crypto, wanting to avoid government influence in, a, in their currency and also wanting to protect their savings from, from uh, inflation. When we think about that crypto curious portion, uh, they have a different set of demographic characteristics and also a different set of, of benefits that they're most interested in. So first off, they have a much wider age range, including many younger uh, consumers who are, who are interested in taking that leap. They also have a much higher percentage of women who are interested in joining the ecosystem. And they tend to come from the middle to lower income groups. So this next phase of crypto uptake um, will include, include a wider range of Latin American consumers. And what that means is that their preferences for, for the benefits of crypto are also uh, slightly different from those, those uh, early adopters. Uh, namely, they, they certainly are interested in the investment factor, but they're much more interested in crypto as a, as a vehicle for protecting their savings and gaining access to more stable assets or stable currencies uh, through uh, digital currencies uh, such as stable coins. So this is to say that, that crypto companies uh, and, and financial institutions that are thinking about enabling access to crypto um, should think very carefully about how to uh, follow these consumers and, and build products that will help to serve their, their preferences and serve their interests. On the right, uh, just to, to finish up here, uh, consumers, uh, even as they are enthusiastic about crypto, do still have many concerns about uh, crypto assets. Certainly, uh, there, there's a lack of understanding of crypto, which I think goes for, for uh, consumers everywhere, including some, some of those uh, who you know, have, have more knowledge of the space as new products come out, with, which challenge our, our understanding. But there also is a... a a uh, high level of concern about the risk of price collapse. Um, so given you know, the, the volatility that we've seen uh, over the last several months in, in uh, major cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and ETH, um, there is a concern that the savings protection um, or the, the uh, ability of, of crypto to retain value might be at risk. Um, and then to a lesser extent, but still quite significant, there's a fraud concern among consumers uh, and a concern that, that governments will impose regulations that will limit access to these assets. So this is all to say that there are substantial opportunities to serve the interests of both early adopters, but also the next generation of crypto users. Um, but that may require uh, uh, addressing some of the concerns and, and, and trying to increase consumer comfort with crypto. One other use case, or one use case in particular that we wanted to zoom in on is crypto remittances. So the possibility of using crypto as a, as a means for receiving funds from abroad. Um, so as we can see here, there is substantial interest in crypto as a tool for improving cross-border payments across all markets. Uh, with the most interest uh, expressed here uh, by Peruvian consumers uh, and Argentines and the least interest expressed by Brazilians. Now, one interesting uh, segment that I, that I wanna just note is, uh, is Mexican consumers who 15% of whom um, expressed an interest in receiving crypto remittances. Um, that 
that's not the highest number we have here, but certainly uh, as a percentage of, of Mexico's total inbound volume would be a substantial amount of money. And I know that Abram can speak to this uh, in, in just a short while, um, but I know that that's something that the Bitso is thinking about uh, quite a bit, uh, enabling that, that corridor. Uh, and then just on the right here, uh, we have this interest in crypto remittances broken down uh, by demographics. So we see that younger consumers are much more interested in this, this potential use case uh, than our older consumers, which reflects the, the general openness of, of younger consumers to uh, trying out different financial products, um, especially if they see a, a tangible financial benefit to them. And then we also see more of an interest uh, among lower and middle income consumers saying that, that even among those consumers who may um, still be quite attached to cash, there is an interest in, in this, this uh, use case of crypto as a vehicle for receiving remittances. So this is, is very much something to watch in the crypto space uh, and will, would certainly be a disruptive presence if, if uptake increased in, in this area. And then a final piece that we want to touch on in this segment of, of the webinar is crypto evangelization. So thinking about that segment, uh, that, that roughly 20% of consumers who are interested in purchasing crypto but have not done yet, done so yet. Um, we asked uh, these, these consumers uh, in our survey, what would make crypto more attractive to you? What would be a pull factor that could bring you into the crypto ecosystem? And the results are fascinating. So first, uh, we see that more than half of these consumers said that, that access to crypto through a trusted international brand, such as Visa, MasterCard, or PayPal, uh, would make them more comfortable with participating in the cryptocurrency ecosystem. And this uh, is a, a, a very uh, important call to action uh, to, to note that, that the endorsement of brands that consumers already trust uh, can be a powerful catalyst for uptake of crypto. Uh, we then see that, that the next uh, highest uh, crypto evangelization factor is the ability to spend a crypto balance with a debit card. So this is interesting because one of the, the questions that many consumers have about crypto is, okay, so I have a balance, I have a crypto uh, wallet, but what can I do with that other than seeing the value go up or down? And consumers, uh, uh, nearly half of the consumers that, that we pulled in this segment um, were interested in crypto debit cards as a vehicle for spending that, that balance at the point of sale, which again speaks to the, the, uh, the demand for this type of product, which is uh, just now being rolled out by, by some exchanges in the Latin America region. Uh, another important feature, uh, another important factor here is that crypto access through a local bank would also be a, a uh, catalyst for crypto uptake, uh, which we can connect again to that point about endorsement of crypto by trusted institutions. Um, so the, the uh, Latin American consumers who are interested in crypto um, are, are very interested in, in doing so in a way that, that connects with the brands and connects with the financial tools that they already trust and they already uh, feel comfortable uh, with using to manage their finances. And then the final piece, uh, the ability to spend a crypto balance with a QR code was a, a substantial uh, share, nearly a third of these consumers, um, but less so we should note than that debit card share, um, which speaks again to, to the growing enthusiasm for, for cards generally among Latin American consumers, uh, which certainly applies in the crypto space. So these are just some initial findings uh, from, from us taking the temperature of the region, um, but with some very powerful implications for how uh, members of the payments ecosystem should approach consumers and, and uh, serve their, their growing interest for cryptocurrency products. With that, I'll turn it back to Lindsay. All right, thank you, Tim. Uh, okay, so if we, we go to the next slide here, we'll, we'll invite uh, uh, Ram to, to come online. And, uh, and uh, I also wanna remind everyone, uh, 
if you if you arrived late, please feel free to ask your questions uh, in the panel below, and we'll incorporate your questions into our discussion here. So thank you, Tim, for sharing some fascinating data. Um, I, I want to point out that the data shows that already 8% of the general Latin American population has acquired cryptocurrency. That's a pretty impressive number. You know, when we share that in our conversations, it's a surprising, surprising finding. Um, so Abraham, I want to turn it over to you. And I want to, uh, first off, get your initial reactions to some of these, num these numbers. Um, some of the, the findings that we that we saw in our survey, do they track more or less with, with the BITSO experience so far? Uh, and just 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 tell us a little bit how how uh, your, your response to, to some of this content. Absolutely. I think that this investigation is super insightful and it resonates with a lot of the information that we have in the market. Um, it's super important to understand how Latin Americans look at crypto. Because sometimes in some uh, other economies, in other more developed economies, uh, people tend to think that crypto might be only some, uh, some speculative mean to, for investments or something like that. But in Latin America, it's a, it's a real solution for some problems that, that we have. The ones that Tim was talking about, about unbanked population, about the mobile penetration, about the volatility of our fiat currencies, of our fiduciary money. So there are some geographies in LATAM where seeking for a store of value is something really natural that they will, that some people will every month worry about. So understanding crypto in that way and understanding that crypto might be an evolution of money to, to new frontiers, it's, it's super important. And most of the insights brought in this analysis is what they imply, that technology is moving faster than money. So we need the convergence between technology and money. Great. And I, I love that, that idea that technology is moving faster than money and because those in the ecosystem are in the payments ecosystem, that's almost why we're doing the session is to help people accelerate their thinking about this and understand this is this is something that's happening now and it will continue to accelerate. And so Abraham, let me ask you, you know, I love, I love learning, you know, of, about Bitso's kind of motto, right? Of, of or or mission. I don't know, you can correct me, but making crypto useful. Um, and so you saw a little bit of the use cases that people are interested in. You saw a few of the factors that might convince people to use cryptocurrency, how do you, can you tell us, how do you think about making crypto useful? What does this mean to you? And what are some strategies that you've already employed that you've seen successful? Yeah, absolutely. So crypto is, some people tend to think that crypto is some kind of a financial asset, but that's one of the definitions. But in, in, in its nature, crypto is technology. And um, when you convert something into an engineering problem, that basically that's technology, a lot of things can evolve a lot faster. So if you convert or you turn the economic unbalance and economic access problem and analyze it as an engineering problem, then there are a ton of ways of making a solution. An example of that is, for example, in the internet, when people started addressing the information sharing problem as an engineering problem, uh, then some technological solutions come up. And in, in Bitso, we say make crypto useful because today, on today it's a lot easier, but five years ago, interacting with Ethereum or Bitcoin or whatever blockchain, it was quite complex. It was like, a, I don't know, like interacting with the internet in the early 90s. Then things came along in the internet that uh, expanded the use of, of that network in a huge, in, a, in an exponential way. The internet explorers such as Mosaic and other ones. So right now in Bitso, our motto is make crypto useful because we want that people use the, the benefits of crypto in their day to day as they will, as we today are using the internet. This doesn't mean uh, providing exposure to a volatile asset, but that's maybe one of the misconceptions, is making a transfer from Mexico 
to Argentina in five seconds with a with a little so so little cost or paying uh, your coffee in Brazil with Bitcoin something like that that those kind of things are are things that today might seem a little far fetched but adoption is just increasing so reducing the the friction between this great technology and the impacts that I, that it can have that's the the whole definition of bitso and making crypto useful okay fantastic and um you know you spoke to some of those use cases that consumers are interested in or that you envision right it, it, that making crypto useful down the line um can you speak to us a little bit about the adoption level so far and who is using crypto so far, according to you guys in your platform? We saw in our survey results that so far it's really it's the early adopters, right? You know, middle, uh, late 20s into 40s, mostly male, high income. It's kind of like an early adopter of financially and technologically savvy population. And then, the, as Tim pointed out, the next wave of adoption is going to be among more the middle of the pyramid and a more diverse group of consumers. So does that track so far with what you're seeing? And, and what is necessary to make to, to make those crypto curious people finally decide to, to, to purchase crypto and get involved? Yeah, definitely we're seeing something like that. And that's why growth is being exponential because we're moving from early adopters to early followers. So mm-hmm. Bitso, it took several years to achieve Uh, our first million users, then uh, some months to achieve the second million and a lot less months to achieve the third million. So we're expecting to to have four million users early, like really fast before, you know, when you see that exponential adoption curve, it's just that that's only going to accelerate. accelerate. So uh, where, what does we need to, to move to bring the next 10 million users to crypto. I think that there are a couple of, of definitions and actually that slide that, that you presented where, with things that people need to, to invest in crypto or not only invest, but use crypto, that, that really resonates with us. For mm-hmm. example, uh, a brand that they can trust and they can identify. And that's a common, like a common process in any technology. For example, when a thing like, I don't know, Uber came up, first it was was kind of weird. How are are you gonna go into a car of someone that you don't know that you asked through an app? And then it's a commodity, right? You you cannot move without a ride hailing up that what whichever that is. So people need to be more identified with a brand and with something that uh, provides them security. And that's why that's one of the main reasons on why Bitso is so keen to work with regulators. So mm. because a, a way to to prove, like to walk the talk that you are re- reliable is if you have the regulators validation. And not only validation, but you're helping move, you're helping to move this technology and this industry in a way that it's tied to the best practices in the world of custodying assets, of providing security, and of a ton of different things. So that's why one of the main reasons. And obviously, the, that's really related also with the expansion and adoption of, of the brand across uh, different uh, acquisition mechanisms for users, right? For, for bits to acquire more, more users. That's the first one, like a trusted brand or someone that you can trust or somewhere that you can trust to understand crypto. The second one, I think that it's also super important that it's how easy is it to use? Like opening a a crypto, a Bitso account, it can take five minutes. And if you go to the bank to open a bank account, well, God forbid how how long you're you're gonna take. Uh, Starting with leaving your house to open a bank account, that's a huge friction for a user. In, in Bitsu or in, this, in these platforms, you can download an app and then onboard really fast. And also in, in the part of the ease to use, people, they don't want to understand and to share or yeah, they don't want, they don't need to understand 
how the blockchain works or what proof of work is on what miners are or whatever. It's like coming again with this uh, analogy with the internet, we don't need to, to understand the protocols that connect email to your Gmail. You just need to send an email and get it in seconds. So the is to use is it, it's something that we need to, that we are really deep diving. And the third one is that education, 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 because people don't need to understand, but people need to be able to understand in an easy way. For, mm -hmm. if, for people that are curious to know what's happening, they need to have all the resources to understand how, how Bitcoin works, who is Satoshi Nakamoto, what is proof of work, <laughs> what is a hash, because it's a part that it's absolutely passionate on understanding these topics. It's also important to provide transparency and visibility of how things work. Mm -hmm. So Abraham, how do you, that's a very interesting point. And, and there's a lot of questions that come up based on what you just said, but I suppose my first question is how do you balance I mean, essentially, you have two very different user bases, right? People who don't need to understand blockchain, they're looking for an alternative to banking solutions. And others who are really passionate about the blockchain, they're really passionate about the technology. And, and so how do you balance these two groups have different needs, different levels of expectation? How do you balance that? And, and how do you provide education? I'm asking kind of very practically, how do you guys deliver education to those who, who are very new to, to crypto? Absolutely. So uh, fortunately in Bitso, I'm, I'm leading the education efforts because there, there are a ton of elements on why educating people. The first one is because when you have an educated user base, then you have to step up your game and deliver better products because they are going to be more, they are going to ask more for More sophisticated, better more demanding, right? Exactly, exactly. More sophisticated, more demanding. And also, they will understand how things work. So we, we, we've had, uh, for example, people sending Bitcoin across the globe and raising a ticket like one minute afterwards, like, where's my money? I haven't received it. And it's, don't worry, it's, it takes 10 minutes. You need to mine a blog, blah, 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 right? So, but people need to have that answer beforehand in order to use the network in the right way. So that, that's the first part. The second part is that the more a, more a more educated user will use a lot more the product. Mm. Why? Because I can, I, I might be one of the, uh, I don't know, like top users of Bitso just because I, I, I love trading. Well, I, I don't not trade, but I love accessing Bitcoin, right? So. And, I, and that's why, because I've been studying this industry for the, for the past six years. So that's the second one. And the, the most important one is that we have, I have this saying that the price of Bitcoin and the volatility of Bitcoin is like a Trojan horse for freedom and financial freedom. Mm. Because a lot of people will resonate with this, that they will enter saying like, oh, the, this industry has such a huge volatility and gains, and they will look at, at the price and they'll acquire a little bit of Bitcoin and they will, they will say, what, what is Bitcoin? And then, you know, you go to all this questioning about what is money, how does money work, right. what is inflation? And those huge analyses that when you study Bitcoin and crypto, you start seeing things that you cannot see, you cannot unsee anymore, right? So this ignites a huge, uh, like, framework of questioning and understanding our financial system and answering your final question we have we're building we already have a beta version of bitso edu that you can go that it's edu.bitso.com and we are structuring that in a way that we want to gamify and to help mm. people understand okay. because whenever you go to any of these sites that tries to provide a crypto education you can go and say what is bitcoin and you read that, that article and the next article link is like, what is liquidity mining or what is another super complex topic? There, there's not a way that say, okay, read what is Bitcoin, then read, uh, I don't know, what's a hash and then read what's Ethereum, then read what's a smart contract. And at the end, you have this type of a Bitso certified uh, user in Bitcoin. 
So you'll have like a tag and oh, fascinating. A, an, an incentive for people to, to say, okay, so I read one, two, three, four, then I have this like a uh, price. And the thing is that everything needs to be, it's about the type of content and convenience. People don't want to read, I don't know, a book to say that they understand Bitcoin. They want a validation and they want a path like easily delivered for them. So that's what we're building. And we are in an initial, in our initial deployments and we want to be the top crypto educator in Latin America because this is a technology that will change our lives. Mm -hmm. Imagine that our parents knew about the internet or if you that are listening knew about the internet in 1995, maybe you'd be in a different place just because of that information asymmetry, understanding that the internet was gonna be the next big thing. Right now that's the position in crypto and crypto is already the next big thing. Just mm -hmm. We just need to look at the market cap and all the adoption uh, metrics. That exponential adoption, as you mentioned, that great. Yes, thank you so much. I, I love, you know, it's it's very true that a good client or a good customer is an educated customer, and so the fact that that's a top priority for you and you have a creative way of of delivering that that that's very interesting. Tim, uh -huh. did you want to jump in? Yeah, I uh, would love to ask a follow up, kind of pairing a couple of the topics that you've addressed, Abram. I am very interested in how you think about serving the needs of that, you know, the next generation of crypto users who maybe won't have as deep an understanding of, uh, you know, Satoshi and, and, and the technical aspects of various cryptocurrencies and just want something that will work and work better than what they previously had. And particularly, you know, it seems like every day there are new cryptocurrencies being launched Bitso is adding new cryptocurrencies that can be traded. Um, and so when a, you know, a less uh, crypto savvy user enters the app. Um, you know, they may now see you know, uh, 15 uh, cryptocurrencies, each with their own different uh, characteristics and, and uh, utility. And so I wanted to ask how you think about, again, very simply communicating the, the power of crypto to those consumers. And I particularly wanted to tie that to an example of something that Bitso launched very recently, which is a kind of a combined stable coin uh, tool where it's drawing, it's, it gives a, a singular unified balance of USD uh, stable coins, even though it contains three different uh, classes of, of USD backed uh, stable coins, which kind of is an interesting way to overcome that hurdle to say, it doesn't matter to the, you know, the average user, whether it's uh, USDC or true, true USD, they just wanna know, you know what it's going to do for them. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So the, the answering the first one of the on the asset offering in Bitsu, that's why education is so important and structured, simple education is so important because we are titling this concept of uh, of education with, with learning paths. Mm. So once a, a user gets into this platform that we are still building. For example, we can have a learning path about DeFi and there we can educate people about the different assets that we've included like Uniswap and Chainlink that basically they are under the same kind of ecosystem that it's DeFi. So imagine that some user says, what is, what is Uniswap? So they click and they go to the article about Uniswap and they in the learning path, they can read, read before what is chain link or read after what is compound. And there we have the assets that we have, that we already have included. So that's why, that's how we're, uh, how we're envisioning that. And one of the most important and challenging things is how, how are we going to inspire curiosity for people to get there? And that's, we're working on that. And that's why we have like this, uh, this price of, of the certification because people want to be acknowledged for everything. And this is a prediction. And in, in some months, you're going to see people in LinkedIn sharing their bits of certified and whatever that we're going to, because you do, we already see that, right? Everyone, every time that someone finishes a Coursera course, they just pay for the, 
certificate for so that they can publish it in LinkedIn. Obviously, users are not going to pay for this, but we want to educate these users. And the second thing that we were regarding your question is, then again, people people really don't care about about how things work as long as they're safe, right? And that's why it's important for us the safety. That's why. For example, in Mexico, we were the first entity to be to have the fintech. Well, our commercial partner in Bio, that under that is a partner on, to, on which we operate, was the first company to to be to have the fintech license. The and this is in Bio, right? So we are in the forefront of, of the regulation to provide that uh, to provide that security for users. And once something is safe, is validated. Seven years of, of, of trajectory for bit, so huge investors, the first crypto unicorn in Latam, all those things are validations. Then you just need something that works and works a lot better. So that's what we're building, like identifying those use cases where sending money from Mexico to the to the US is ten times better than sending it through your bank account or through other through other means. Perfect. Thank you, Abraham. Um... Wow, we have a lot of questions from the audience, and so I'm going to try to weave them in as we continue our discussion. But you just mentioned remittances, which uh, which inevitably is related to financial inclusion and digitization, right? And so one of our questions from the audience is, you know, will the low levels of digital inclusion across the region impact adoption of crypto? Uh, it sounds like the person seems to think that it, it will negatively impact the adoption of crypto. Perhaps it, crypto actually will really be a motor for increased digital and financial inclusion. How do you all think about uh, including be, including folks who who have either decided not to get involved with banks or maybe haven't had access to them in the past? Yeah, that's a great question because it's all about friction. Uh, it's the same thing as, as I was mentioning at the beginning. How hard is to obtain, to open a bank account? For a lot of people in Mexico, it's not about a, a problem of annoyance. It's a, really, it's a real problem about access. So some, some people in Mexico are underbanked, meaning that they need to travel one hour, 30 minutes, or a, a huge time of annoyance to access a bank account. But they need financial services. Right, they everybody needs financial services. Money is, so, is something so intrinsic to humanity that everybody needs financial services. So, the thing is that these people, there are a lot more probable to have uh, a, cell, uh, a smartphone than access to a bank. So that's where we reduce friction. And then again, the thing is about how we increase the. The, the access to people through crypto services. So it's about how to expand this kind of services and how people, what's the need for, for their financial services. Remittances, cash to cash remittances are most of the remittances in this huge, the biggest remittance corridor in the world that is the Mexican peso, the US, US dollar. So, and that's cash, the cash to cash remittances, it only works here and it's so expensive only because there is not yet uh, another better product to do it. But it's it's a matter of time to do mm -hmm. that. It's a matter of time that transactions are some uh, someone in the US that wants to send a remittance to Mexico to send it through crypto in seconds, because if they do that, then uh, and they, they can do it through it. So the, their family will have access to money in seconds or in minutes maybe so those things are are, are are just about adoption and people sometimes when we run this kind of analysis we we always think uh, or we try we tend to think that people like really analyze the use cases and the benefits um what they're doing in reality they just want a need to use and also sometimes we, we tend to think that people are, we tend to think like in a protective way of, of the population. And that's not right. People are really clever and, mm -hmm. they, will feel, and, and they will figure this, this type of solutions as we build them, uh, as we build the solutions for them. 
I love that. I, I love that, that thinking. I mean, it's, it's true. People adopt, people adopt, people are looking to reduce pain and increase convenience or pleasure or, or whatever value, whatever it is. And so whatever pathway they find is, is where they're, where they're going to go. I, I, I really appreciate that comment. Um, uh, let's, let's get into a little bit. We have several questions in the chat here related to El Salvador. And so, um, you know, I know you all were, were involved. Can you just tell us a little bit about what's going on in El Salvador? Very interesting market on the, on the global stage and a little bit about your involvement. Um, and one particular question here is, you know, what are the risks now that uh, Bitcoin is legal tender? Um, you know, we think we know that the benefits are clear, but what, what could be some potential, some potential risks? Absolutely. So I think that El Salvador is a great example of how technology moves faster than money. And for the, the adoption of people of, of El Salvador, around of 70% didn't have access to a bank account, to any financial services. It's purely a dollarized cash uh, economy. So with the adoption of Bitcoin, is uh, this this can change? This changed in days. Today they have more than three million users with a population of more than of around of seven seven million people. So adoption is increasing. So why is this? There is this project uh, called Bitcoin Beach that basically where everything started, and uh, we interviewed one of the founders. And they, this, this person told me the story about, uh, it was someone called, I think, Don Ramon or something like that. That was a fisherman that, was, that never had access to, to financial services. It was 100 cash all his life. And then because of the project, he started gaining uh, payments in Bitcoin. And by obtaining payments in Bitcoin, just by having a financial service, that was a wallet, this person understood or, or got the opportunity to save whatever, whatever uh, amount they, it saved, but money was not uh, burning in his hands anymore. He could store it safely somewhere in a digital means. And the, the story finishes like with a great uh, happy ending where this, this fisherman changed all his tooth or his teeth because now he had access to, to, to Bitcoin or, and to, to savings, not to Bitcoin. It doesn't matter if it's Bitcoin, Ether, whatever, but it had access to, finan to a financial service. And to the most basic one, like storing their money without uh, fearing that someone is gonna hijack them, you know? So this impact is huge for a population. And that, that's a great example of how sometimes, uh, well, so sometimes more developed, economies don't understand this because in some way they can trust banks, in some way they can trust uh, that their money is not going to disappear like overnight. That that happens in Latin America, that happens, that happened like in Argentina. So the, the, there's a huge potential there and that's like, that's making crypto useful, you know, not providing access for people and Bitso has helped specifically with custody services and with the exchange capabilities for, for, for those processes. So uh, El Salvador is a super interesting experiment. Obviously, uh, risks are, are there of, of Bitcoinizing the economy, but I think that we need to be cautious in the way that sometimes headlines, well, not sometimes, always headlines are more like are bigger than they that they appear. So El Salvador is, is still a dollarized uh, country. And dollars, dollar is the unit of account and the, the main settlement currency for El Salvador. So just having a, a decentralized international global 24 seven network doesn't break anything from what El Salvador is having in a dollarized economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Abraham, I, I want to follow up on, on that point you mentioned about the continued dollarization of, of El Salvador, um, because one thing, one feature of the Chivo wallet 
that I think has, is less flashy, but at least in the near term may be more important is the fact that it can either hold Bitcoin or dollars and has you know, instant convertibility between those. And so I wanted to ask, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, at least in the near term, um, whether El Salvadoran consumers and users of the Chiva wallet will be more inclined to use that, that dollar, digital dollar transfer feature or whether they will be experimenting with Bitcoin as, as an option to use in, in uh, commerce? That's a great question. And let me start by uh, an initial like distinction. When we talk about Bitcoin, we need to understand that there are two elements there. The asset, Bitcoin the asset, that it's spelled with a small cap B, and Bitcoin, the network, that it's spelled with a capital B or with an all cap B. So what's the main difference? The Bitcoin network is the network that it's 24 seven that can operate uh, permissionless globally, all the, all the great features that we know. There is this thing called the Lightning Network that is a, a faster settlement mechanism for the Bitcoin network. The asset that is transported or, or transferred through the Bitcoin network is Bitcoin. So when people transfer Bitcoin are using the Bitcoin network, okay? So these assets is native for, of this network are, and it's important because of its decentralization and its uh, economic policy that you cannot have, there are not gonna be any, never more than 21 million bitcoins. Every 10 minutes, a round of 6.25 bitcoins are created. All those things. So the the convertibility and holding dollars. Like I can send you, team, right now. I don't know five dollars in bitcoin through the Lightning Network, and maybe you'll never know that it was bitcoin. You'll receive five dollars because you'll have instant convertibility. But if I wanted to do that with the Swift or with Western Union, it's impossible. Only the fees are like $25. So I cannot do that. So it's important to understand this difference between the network and the asset. And sometimes in the news, people only go to understand the asset and not the network. And the network is a lot more important than the asset because the network is the thing that connects the financial system. The network is the technology. The asset is just another asset. Yeah, that is such a powerful point. And I think really spe speaks to the fact that many consumers, even those who aren't enthusiastic about holding uh, a crypto asset would be very interested in the benefits of having crypto you know, speed up and reduce the cost of transfers. And uh, so I think it's really interesting to think about how crypto can enhance the plumbing of the, or the, the, the inner mechanisms of the, the financial system that, that gets money to uh, people living throughout this region. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I love putting this example, like again, comparing with the internet, the first companies that were successful in the internet were in infrastructure companies, infrastructure technology companies, the AOLs, the companies that literally created the cables to connect your phone to this global network. After, afterwards, the Facebooks came, the Amazons came, the, the, the Twitches came, the Pinterests, but the Netflix, but those were like ideas in the early days of the internet. Those, way, those, those were like things that people said, so you're gonna watch TV on the internet. Okay, good luck. We'll talk in 100 years or whatever. And then it happened. So it's the same thing with crypto. Right now we're creating the pipes and there are all these exciting projects with DeFi that they will come to light as technology evolves. So it's a matter of time, I think. Abraham, thank you so much. I, I, I really like that metaphor of, of laying the pipes in these early stages. And then once that's done, it's like the possibilities are, are endless. We probably can't even imagine the implications that will come. So thank you very much. Uh, you know, we have a lot of questions in the chat. So we're going to try to, you know, connect with you guys offline to answer some of these questions. We'll have to schedule another call with you, Abraham, to continue this discussion. So much uh, engagement. Thank you all so much.
Uh, we're just going to wrap up in the last few minutes here. So I'll turn it back over to Tim to kind of present our final takeaways. Um, so over to you, Tim. Absolutely. Thank you, Lindsay. And uh, we've talked about uh, many different aspects of the crypto ecosystem and crypto uptake over the last uh, hour, but three big things that we want you to take away and be thinking about when you, when you uh, think about crypto and LATAM. First is that there is exploding interest for uh, crypto products um, with some 8% of consumers already having purchased crypto and another nearly 20% uh, is, is interested in purchasing. purchasing. But these next generation, uh, this next generation of consumers um, is much more interested in crypto as a tool for protecting their savings and getting access to more stable money um, and alleviating the concerns about crypto uh, of these next, uh, uh, this next wave of crypto consumers. Um, it, one strategy to do that is through endorsements from, from trusted institutions. So either you know, your international brands or through local banks that can enable access to, uh, to crypto assets, um, for example, through a partnership with, uh, with Bitso. Um, and then a final, uh, a final thing that, that we'll just mention is that uh, crypto integrations, uh, uh, particularly those that are seamless, are gonna be fundamental for enabling the usage of crypto. So we talked uh, a bit about crypto enabled debit cards, uh, these kinds of tools that fit neatly into consumers, uh, that in, into the tools that they are already comfortable with and in their preferences for, for how they pay for things. Those are gonna have the highest chance, at least in the near term of bringing consumers uh, into the ecosystem. So these are, these are tools that, that everyone in the, in the payments ecosystem should be thinking about enabling. And then a final piece from us, uh, just to mention um, AMI, as, as Lindsay mentioned, we are a research firm and we have um, a, a suite of, of research project, uh, products uh, and services that we wanted to mention uh, for, for all on the chat today. Um, so we have uh, kind of three main buckets here up at the top. We do offer corporate crypto workshops. So uh, getting your team up to speed on the latest developments in the crypto space, as well as uh, helping you to craft a, a crypto strategy. We also offer a, a, a monitoring service uh, to, to help you stay abreast of developments in the crypto space and, and regulatory shifts that are going to be important uh, for, for the future of the ecosystem. And then finally, uh, we do uh, research engagements like the one that we, we presented today, uh, only on a larger scale um, and tailored to your needs and your interests. Um, and as Lindsay mentioned, that this this data uh, doesn't exist uh, yet, or it's not not well well published or well covered. And so there's an opportunity uh, to be the first one to have it and gain a strategic edge. Um, so we will, uh, you can uh, reach out to me, uh, uh, my email's there, but we'll also put out a quick poll uh, to, to gauge interest and we can follow up um, and, uh, and, and chat with you at greater length um, about uh, how we can help support you uh, in crafting, craft, crafting a crypto strategy. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, just to mention, you guys, if you know, this is a confusing space, there's a lot to learn. Uh, so just just reach out if you're curious about, you know, how we can help you uh, better understand the space and better develop your strategy. Uh, totally no pressure. We'll just reach out if, if that's of interest to you. So just take another 10 to 15 seconds to get uh, everyone a chance to respond. And in the meantime, while we're wrapping this up, Abraham, I want to um, thank you again so much for being here. And uh, any final thoughts you want to leave us with as we as we close out uh, close out today's session? Perfect. Thank you for the invite. Uh, we're always super happy to participate in these spaces. Count count with count on me and on Bitso for any any follow up that you need. And I think that. The, the final thing that I've that I love always to say in this kind of forums is that crypto and Bitcoin are a technology and technology sometimes might be uh, might be scary, but we need to understand it and we need the best way is understanding it from a, from a, like being thoughtful of what's happening. Obviously if you ever, 
meet someone that says like buy Bitcoin is the future and just invest in it. Maybe you need to be worried about that people. We need to have like be down to earth, understand how the technology is evolving. And also I have never met someone. This is literal. I have never met someone in, in my life that after reading a little bit about Bitcoin are not curious or don't want to understand it in some way. We have examples as Paul Tudor Jones, Stanley Druckenmiller, like the big investors up until like my father, you know? So just having a position of denial to a technology because of press can be a risk for your business and for yourself. Mm -hmm. So we need to be open to understand this industry. I love that final insight, Auron. Thank you so much. I think it's true that these advanced technologies, they awaken something in us, right? Something that's that's reaching for more, that wants greater possibilities and wants to believe in something greater. So, you know, something to, to be embraced and to, and to be open to. So thank you so much for your, your, your passion, your knowledge, for sharing with us. Uh, Tim, thank you so much. Uh, for for walking us through that data, everyone. Thank you for being here. Again, we'll be sending out the, the the deck and the recording, so keep your eyes out for that. And we look forward to seeing you in another session soon. Have a great rest of your day.